in the aftermath of the adoption of the Palermo Protocol, today we continue with the last of our three webinars on international prosecution of human trafficking. Our webinar today shall focus on best practices and how they can be shared and applied by judges and other stakeholders, including civil society. Today, we are very fortunate to welcome six distinguished speakers. Monsignor Marcelo Sanchez Sorondo, Judge Fausto Poca, John McCarthy, Morgan Nico, Brian Islin, and last but not least, Don Fortunato Di Noto. Sister Miriam Baike will also join us as discussant. To our audience, please write your question in the questions and answer section in the chat. We will address them at the end of the webinar. And now it's my great honor to give the floor to Monsignor Marcelo Sanchez Sorondo, Chancellor of the Pontifical Academy of Social Science. Uh, Monseigneur, vous avez la parole. Un espagnol ou oh, un français, qu'est-ce que vous préférez? Non, mais. Euh, <laughs> thank you very much for the invitation. I am very happy to be with you in this moment with this webinar. Uh, I want to go to the to the rest, to the questions. Uh, after our experience, as you know, the academy is uh, with this uh, goal uh, because it was the Pope Francis to us to the academy to try to understand the problem of the new form of slaves, and uh, then immediately we organized a meeting with them best leaders, global leaders, religious leaders, and with the Pope, these leaders uh, declared that the new form of slaves in the figure of forced labor, prostitution, and uh, traffic of organs are a crime against to humanity. Uh, after five years of Seventh year of experience to work in this line, uh, we arrived to uh, to be concretely at two conclusions. The first conclusion that we need to work with the law because we don't have clearly an international law that declare that these are this new form of slaves. First of all, to declare that this is a new form of slave. Second, to declare that this is a crime against to humanity. What is the importance of this? The importance of this is that in all the countries, only the crime against to humanity not have term. We can take the, the criminals in all time, and this continue to be a great penalty. And the second advantage, the second force that if we have a clear laws, international, national and international, to declare that is a crime against humanity, is that the states, the different states, in some sense, are responsible of the things that are in the jurisdiction of these states. So, in some sense, the states, the governments, are responsible of these crimes in his states. So, it's very important to change, to 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 change, to change better the law because there are many laws, but not so clear international about this. The second, the second question, so for example, I try to put in, in my country, in Argentina, uh, an law to say that the human body, that today 
we today think that the human person is the human body, but anyway, the human body is very important. And we say the human body has a special dignity. Of the point of view theological, we say the human body is image of God. So St. Thomas Aquinas say not only the soul, but also the body in the measure to have a soul. So we can say the human body is image of God and the human body not can self, net to ne all, ne part of the body, but only can give by love. So uh, if you propose this, this kind of things, the people, the people understand and the people are, uh, are disposed to change things. If you on the country propose a law against the prostitution or against the forced labor or against the traffic of organs, yes, of course, but it's not the same. We need to put a law in the, in a positive way to defend and promote the dignity of the human body. And of course, this is value for all these form of slaves because in the end, what is a slave? A slave is a person to suffer a violence in, uh, in, and not can be, uh, um, uh, not, not can be, uh, dominus, not, not can, not can be, uh, uh, not can use his, his freedom to, uh, to choice uh, his life in the end. So it's a person to solve violence by a, another person or completely or partial and not can be, not can realize himself. So it's very important. So to work in the laws. The second question, very important, is uh, to solve the problem of the victims. And uh, of course, we need to have laws for this. But anyway, we have some. Uh, and uh, for this, uh, we have different protocols, we can say. Uh, I, I very much um, admire the Mexican protocol because the Mexican protocol, uh, each state have uh, some house that they call refugio, uh, refuge, and uh, where the victims uh, can have an uh, information and conversion and uh, independently of, I say conversion, not only in the religious sense, but understand uh, that they are victims and understand that they can have a different life but also they can have a title, they can take a profession that can have a life also um, in the society with the money necessary to, to have a family and to have uh, all the things that we need in their life. For example, in the Mexicans, some governor give to this victim an apartment and uh, uh, give uh, the possibility to have an uh, education, depend of the cap capabilities of the person. So uh, these are the two questions, laws and uh, the reinsertion of the victims in the society. Uh, there are different models, but look, uh, in the reinsertion of the victim, of course, the, the, the church have a great experience because there are many in the history, many congregations, especially the women, religious women, that try to, uh, re to first on a sort of recuperation of the victims, especially for prostitution. And uh, the experience is that the reincidence is very big. But what is the reason of this reincidence in the case of religious? Is that these sisters are fantastic to, to give a new formation, to give a new understanding of his personality. But the sister, as such, not know well the, 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 
the world and not have connection to give a this person a formation and an and apartment and house and family. So we need to have two things, the religious uh, important moment, but also the possibility to insert these people in the society with a normal work, a normal profession, a normal mestiere um, or, or like this thing. So I finished. We need to work concretely in these two things. For the prostitution, I want to finish, uh, only uh, add one, one more word. Uh, I admire the, the, the model, the Nordic model that was in the beginning in Sweden, because the modern Nordic for the first time penalized not only the victims, because, for example, in Latin America, today also, The, in many countries, the law penalizes the victims. That is to say, normally the women that uh, are victims of prostitution. In the contrary, this model penalizes not only the trafficker, but also the client. So they penalize the people to create the market, we can say. Uh, so if we don't have interest, if we don't have demand, if we don't have market, they are not victims. So it's very important for me, this model, and uh, I propose, and also this model is today in, in France, and I think the, in, the France has more intelligent application, because uh, just uh, in the Constitution, say, one was a revision of the model uh, with uh, uh, today President Macron, the, the was to say the, the question is the dignity of the human body. And uh, we can uh, we can self the body. We, the, the commerce, the life of the commerce is central in all society, but not by the human body. So I finish really. Thank you very much for your attention and your patience. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Monsignor uh, Marcello Sanchez Sorondo, for all the work the Pontifical Academy is doing uh, in human trafficking. And thank you for your mention of the Nordic model, but also about uh, this question uh, of uh, how uh, the human trafficking uh, can be understood as a crime against humanity. I think it will be uh, uh, Judge Fausto Pocca who will give you uh, uh, your answer. Uh, and Judge First Opakar is Honorary President of the International Institute of Humanitarian Law, Judge of the International Criminal Tribunal for Former Yugoslavia, uh, and Judge Haddock of the International Court of Justice. Uh, uh, but still, I'm not sure we have him online uh, yet. Uh, uh, so uh, if we don't have him Now, uh, I think uh, I, I would like uh, to ask uh, then uh, uh, Morgan. Uh, no, <laughs> Morgan, uh, uh, Morgan Nico, uh, UNODC criminal uh, justice officer. Uh, you um, you are an expert, and we were very happy to have you. Uh, and uh, uh, today, thank you again for uh, uh, being with us. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Michel, and uh, good evening to everyone. So, um, you may have uh, seen me two weeks ago. Uh, I had the role of discussions on prosecuting uh, human trafficking cases uh, and taking stock, and then now we're looking into best practices. So, this time I have the role of presenter, and I would very much like to, to thank Michel and the Order of Malta for organizing this event. I think having these different perspectives is essential. Uh, so I'm presenting the perspective from an international organization. UNODC is an organization, we're part of the UN, the United Nations Secretariat, and we're actually assisting and supporting states implement the international instrument which is defining what is human trafficking. 
uh, this, uh, this, com this protocol, which uh, is complementing the Convention on Transnational Organized Crime, uh, is almost universally ratified, but things are not so simple. Uh, at the national level, the understanding of what human trafficking is, this intersection with slavery, with forced labor, uh, may not be that clear cut. So, so in practice, uh, things may look a bit different. And that's what I would like to actually address today with you. And this first slide you're seeing comes from uh, UNODC's global report on trafficking in persons that was released. Uh, it's the 2020 report uh, that confirms a trend that we have been observing. This report is released every two years. So we've seen in the last uh, more than 10 years the evolution uh, of what is happening in states and how they respond to human trafficking. Now, you need to Keep in mind that this report is only capturing what member states, so the authorities are sharing with us. So these are the official figures that they are sharing with us. And according to these official figures, as you see here, the share of persons who are convicted of human trafficking globally is split between men and women as follows, with 38% of the persons convicted for human trafficking being women. This is a huge amount compared to for other other forms of crime. It's more than three times more uh, than usually female are represented in crime uh, in, in terms of uh, convictions. So we we try to understand why and, and see um, also what's behind and if this is logical, if this should stay like this, or if something can be done about that. So that's what um, I will be telling you about today. And moving to the next slide, uh, voila. here you have two things. On the left hand side, you have a statement which is uh, saying probably what most uh, anti-trafficking advocates uh, promote uh, and is obvious to them is that victims of trafficking in person should not be held responsible criminally for uh, acts that they had to commit while they were being victimized. Uh, while they were being trafficked. Um, it's not something, it's not a pre, I mean, it's not, a, it's not written in international law. However, there's a, a broader and broader consensus uh, that in order to be effective in addressing trafficking in persons, we need to take that into account. And so on the right hand side, you see actually a reference to a study that we released in December that uh, I, um, I led with, uh, with experts where we looked at situations where female were uh, charged with trafficking offenses and trying to understand what was their profile and how did they end up there and how the criminal justice system treated them. And we found very interesting things and that's what I will be telling you about. Um, you need to maybe understand that uh, given that we are UNODC and as we very often refer to the guardian of the protocol, we have a, a privileged relationship with member states and we do receive uh, cases and, um, and various uh, points of views from, from practitioners. And in that case, we looked into our knowledge portal, which is a, um, a place where we, we've been collecting cases over years uh, from various jurisdictions. And so that helped us identify what was happening. So we took 1,500 cases and then we, 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 we looked at a smaller and smaller amount of cases. <coughs> so as I said, this principle here is not written in stone, it's not written in international law, but this has been actually um, promoted at various levels. Uh, in uh, 2002 already, the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights um, um, issued uh, recommended uh, principles and uh, guidelines on human rights and human trafficking. And there you do find similar language. And then actually in 2005, for the first time, this was codified in international law at a regional level. Uh, the Council of Europe Convention on Action Against Trafficking in Human Beings actually does provide for protection against prostitution or punishment for victims of trafficking. So that's that's the framework. That's what we have. Now uh, let's um, uh, let's move up. The, uh, let's look at the findings. Uh, but as um, as a, uh, an introduction before, so I would like to to mention that I will go back to a case, a very interesting case that is uh, only two weeks old, 
uh, that was taken by the European Court of Human Rights uh, exactly on that, on the punishment of victims of trafficking and what states should be doing. Um, so that will be part of the recommendations as well. Um, now, what we know, of course, is that victims of trafficking are, um, are, victi um, are exploited uh, in various forms. Um, and, and while they are being exploited, they may actually be engaging in illegal conduct, such as, for example, prostitution or sex trade, depending on the jurisdiction, involvement in drug production or trafficking, petty crime, document fraud, uh, breaches of immigration law, of course. Sometimes the victims of forced uh, or otherwise compelled to do it by the traffickers. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes they actually also help traffickers uh, commit trafficking offenses. Uh, and, and, and all of this is actually helping traffickers continue co maintaining the control over the victims. <clears throat> so here, the findings from this uh, case uh, analysis we've done um, where we saw very different situations, but what we saw very often is uh, two cases, for example, uh, if you take um, the situation of prostitution and pimping in the US, there was a very clear pattern here of the relationship between uh, the, 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 the persons who were exploited and were looking at women exploited uh, in, in the sex work uh, and the relationship with the pimp who would be traffickers in these cases. And then, of course, and I think most of the audience uh, is aware, uh, there was also the situation of the madams in the Nigerian networks, uh, which are quite typical of, of this evolution of role between uh, being uh, trafficked and, and, and sexually exploited, and then uh, taking a, a more important position in the organization at some stage. So these are type of cases we saw, but of course, there are many others. Um, so the first thing we saw is that it was very obvious that the traffickers used victims to shield themselves from prosecution and enjoy impunity. How, how is that possible? Well, actually, the victims usually have lower ranking roles that make them more easily detected by authorities, by law enforcement. So they, they are the first line of detection, let's say, as offenders by law enforcement. And then those who are organizing uh, manage to, 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 to remain protected by this technique. Uh, for example, these low rank, ranking um, uh, low roles, let's say, uh, would be about recruiting new victims. Um, where there's um, um, monitoring the the, 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 the the earnings of the victims as well, uh, maintaining control over them, uh, advertising for the services, for example. Um, what we also saw, and, and, and that's a very interesting point um, uh, for, for, for a very clear reason here, is that the link between uh, human trafficking and violence against women, domestic violence and intimate partner violence was really obvious. Uh, uh, about 25% of the cases that we examined uh, in, in which the victims had been prosecuted for trafficking offenses, they had suffered one or multiple forms of gender-based violence either before or while being trafficked, and uh, oftentimes in their childhood already. Uh, that could comprise of childhood sexual assault, sexual slavery, domestic and intimate partner violence, forced and child marriage. Um, and what we also saw is that these dimensions uh, of, um, I mean, at the domestic and intimate level uh, were very, very rarely examined by courts. So, um, that left a gap there in the assessment of the situation of the person who was actually victimized, but then uh, prosecuted for trafficking acts or complicity. And, and moving there, so there was this uh, somehow normalization of the exploitation in the context and the situation of many of these victims. And, and then moving on to the more legal issues, um, there was really an, an uncertainty and lack of clarity in the way that uh, the justice system and, and various courts at the national level apply the, the, the means, uh, how do they understand what coercion means, what is the abuse of a position of vulnerability, what consent means and in relation with trafficking, which should be, it should not be relevant because some means have been used, and the use of coercive control. Coercive control is, is really more a notion that we have in domestic violence 
violence against women. And this is where we saw very clear intersections that were very interesting uh, in taking a gender lens to look at, at, at these issues. Um, now, I, would, I, I wanted to tell you about the, the European Court of Human Rights decision two weeks ago, which was a case against the UK. Uh, I, I will put some of the links in the chat so that you can uh, consult them if you wish afterwards. Um, basically, it was um, uh, Vietnamese victims of trafficking were involved in a cannabis uh, production in the UK. Uh, at the time of the events, the, 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 the Vietnamese um, uh, victims were uh, minors, uh, were children. Uh, and at the time, also in the UK, there had been reports of um, the vulnerability of this type of population to being trafficked. And <coughs> what happened is that it was deemed that the authorities did not refer uh, properly or soon enough these persons as potential victims of trafficking, while the cases went on against them as uh, participating in, in drug production and trafficking. Um, so um, what the court's finding um, said was that first, the states owed positive obligations to victims of trafficking, including not only a duty to protect potential victims from prosecution, but also to timely identify them upon detection. So that was really, uh, really quite striking there. We need to also note that it's the first time that the European Court of uh, Human Rights actually makes such a decision where it actually um, demanded that the UK pay some compensation to those victims. Um, <clears throat> so basically, um, the, the reasoning behind it is that if the, I mean, the decision to prosecute potential victims of trafficking while not being prohibited per se in international law, as I mentioned to you beforehand, may be at odds with state's duty to take operational measures to protect victims of trafficking. Uh, so so that's, that was the, the core of the reasoning um, and, and then insisted that uh, uh, early identification was of paramount importance. And that means that, and I'm sorry, I'm getting very much into something legalistic here, but for our friends who work with law, I think that's an important point, is that as soon as the threshold of credible suspicion of trafficking background is met, there must be a prompt assessment by the qualified authorities. They need to have been trained to deal with victims of trafficking so that they can determine if this individual was trafficked uh, based on the criteria that are usually uh, used uh, and based on international standards, uh, including the protocol, of course. And a decision on prosecution should not be made until the process of identification is complete. So here it gives you steps. And this decision now needs to be, okay, it may be appealed. The UK can still appeal this decision, but this decision is supposed to apply <coughs> to all the members of the European Convention on Human Rights now. Uh, which is, I think, 47 member states. So these are interesting developments, uh, especially at a time when we're talking a lot about the non-punishment principle, but it may not be so easy or clear to apply um, in national law. Now, another finding I would just like to flag before we move on non-punishment is <coughs> that you probably familiar with the fact that when it comes sentencing, uh, usually, um, the judges take into account um, the circumstances and see whether they are aggravating or mitigating. In the case of uh, female victims of trafficking for sexual exploitation who became defendants in trafficking cases, it's very striking that the reactions are very different. Actually, you do have jurisdictions or courts that say um, they should have known better. They went through it. So, of course, it's an aggravation that they have been themselves victimized. So we found cases like this. And then we find other cases, and quite typically in Argentina, for example, where they say, no, 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 this must be a medication. This is absolutely essential. We need to understand that. And, and um, this is something we'd like to continue working on with states in order to promote this approach and see how it can be done uh, together with everyone involved uh, and, of course, with the the prosecutors, the judges, and the investigators in the first place. Um, now, I'd like to flag this non-punishment principle and, and just remind ourselves why this is relevant and what, why it's important, especially when it comes to trafficking in persons. 
we need to maintain the interest of justice. Uh, and that interest is that victims are not punished for conduct that they would not have committed if they had not been trafficked in the first place. Um, now, we also need to safeguard the rights of the victims. I think here we've been really promoting that for these sessions. Uh, if we want them, I mean, we want them to get immediate access to support, to the services, uh, and we don't want them to go for, through further trauma or victimization. So it's also essential that we take that into account. Um, also, and very important from Yanusi's perspective, although, of course, the, the views here may be different on what should be done, but one of our aim is to put uh, impunity, um, uh, an end to impunity. One of our goals is to put an end to impunity. Um, sometimes it's easier to be able to do that when victims uh, are willing to cooperate. Uh, it should never be an obligation that they're protected only if they cooperate with the justice system. However, when they cooperate, it may really uh, make a difference in the case. So um, we believe that this principle uh, of non-punishment is can actually be an incentive for victims to come forward, uh, report the trafficking, report the traffickers, uh, and, and, and collaborate with the, the justice system. And of course, what we want as well is to expose traffickers to punishment and not have the victims uh, coming in the first row and then no one investigating what's behind. Uh, so that's also extremely uh, important. I'm coming to the last slide now with some recommendations. You will find all of them in the in the documents I'll be sharing with you. These are just some snapshots. Um, I did mention the, um, the, the, the key uh, need to identify early and to do it proactively of the victims. If we don't do that, if we don't know who the victims are, we can't do anything about helping them. So that's, uh, that's uh, the very basic principle that needs to be done, including when people are brought into court uh, as uh, potential offenders, defendants, uh, that's essential. Um, <coughs> Sorry. Um, then, how do we do it in practice? It really depends on the judicial system. Training is uh, is essential. Uh, that we know. We need to have legislation that's also allowing to do that. So it's a proper qualification of what is trafficking in persons in various forms and various types of exploitation as well. So, in some jurisdictions, you see the national law has included the uh, false criminality in forms of exploitation, as we have forced begging as well. For example, very often we see that um, in North Africa with children or West Africa, for example. So adding this type of, uh, of forms of exploitation uh, can really help. And of course, then we can go ahead and have guidance in some jurisdiction or you know, some prosecutorial or sentencing guidelines. That's something that could be uh, also explored. It's uh, spreading the word. Uh, obviously, so increasing awareness among practitioners. That's what we're doing right now with our network and, and bringing in some experts who have actually, as prosecutors, dealt with such cases and managed to um, do their best to try to, to, to protect the victims uh, that were detected through, 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 through these trials. Um, yes, and um, I think for today, we should stop here. I would be happy to answer your questions uh, later on. And as I said, I will put some links in the chat so that you can uh, do some further reading. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, for sharing your experience and expertise and uh, uh, for bringing this very interesting UNODC document, Actually, there is a wealth of documentation on human trafficking on UNODC uh, website, and uh, uh, we we are very happy to uh, to welcome this. Uh, and now I would be uh, happy to have Judge Fausto Pocar because Judge Fausto Pocar uh, might be uh, giving also some additional legal uh, um, advice. Uh, including and especially on the question raised by Monsignor Marcello Sanchez Sorondo on uh, uh, human trafficking as a crime against humanity. First of all, thank you very much for being with us. You have the floor. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, interesting and important seminar on uh, human trafficking. Um, I thought when I accepted uh, that uh, this being the third workshop 
most of the issues would have been clarified before. And uh, that certainly is the case. But the uh, number of issues that this problem uh, presents and uh, um, confers me, especially after hearing Monsignor Sanchez Rondo, uh, that uh, um, much remains to be uh, clarified, actually clarified, especially in the international domain. We, we started with the uh, Palermo Protocol, of course, which is uh, the first uh, definition uh, that we find for human trafficking, quite a complex definition, uh, that is given there, um, bearing in mind that uh, 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 this definition is followed uh, almost universally now, but, uh, um, but still presents some problems when we look at the issue from the point of view of crimes against humanity. Um, the first time I dealt with this matter was in 2000 at a colloquium in Rome, where I had been invited, uh, on human trafficking. And uh, my position was that uh, uh, it was a crime against humanity. I was adamant on that, but I had a number of listeners there who said, well, Professor, are you sure what we are saying? Because uh, there is the, even the Palermo Protocol had not been adopted yet. Say, are you sure what is saying? Say, yes, because it's quite clear if we take uh, the most uh, uh, senior, ancient crime against uh, humanity, which is enslavement, it is clear this is a form of enslavement. And uh, when you have human trafficking, you just sell one person, you trade one person. So that means you are selling a body and uh, Sometimes you try to sell the soul as well, but uh, uh, because you make such a pressure that the soul suffers itself, of course. And uh, uh, de facto, uh, this uh, expression of, I said, of ownership of a person over another person is a, the one of the uh, greatest, the more important crimes against humanity, must be a crime against humanity. If human beings are free and have to be free, you just suppress that freedom and you use another person as being a, 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 an object, a, a property of your, uh, and you, that you own. Uh, I was a bit surprised later, after uh, having read the protocol that come out, uh, came out a few months later after that colloquium, and later on that this idea of ownership was in fact uh, the leading idea, the, the red line for uh, all the problem of trafficking. They go through, not this, but they, it remains a complex phenomenon because uh, it is true uh, the protocol gives a definition of a crime which is not an international crime as such. It says nowhere this is an international crime. This is an ordinary crime uh, at the national level that presents a transnational um, feature, but it remains an ordinary crime. It does not become that level of being a crime against humanity. Um, uh, the, the, this uh, step forward was made uh, uh, later, and by chance, uh, a few months later, I was uh, appointed as a judge to the ICTY. And they had the first case uh, where I sat, um, a case of uh, prostitution, of um, uh, mass rapes, uh, by soldiers uh, uh, committed in the in the conflict in Bosnia, and uh, uh, one of the issues was uh, to define rape first. Even rape was not easy to define because in international law there was no definition, and uh, um, and there was one of the counts uh, the prosecutor brought was sexual enslavement. Now, 
sexual enslavement said, well, I was just dealing with, uh, with uh, trafficking. Sexual enslavement is a form of trafficking, after all, because the trafficking and using then uh, these persons in a certain way, if the general elements of crimes against humanity are met, that is, if you have a widespread or a systematic uh, uh, violation of uh, rights and uh, uh, the perpetrator is aware that he is acting in a context uh, where there, are, uh, there is a, wide, a widespread or systematic uh, uh, commission of crimes against uh, a targeted group, this becomes a crimes against humanity under international law. So I w did not hesitate on that occasion to take the position that this was a crime against humanity and at the same time a war crime committed in war. So, but both a war crime and a crime against humanity, depending on the context in which you see, whether you see the widespread systematic or you see the link with the, with the war. Uh, depending, but these are two elements you can uh, combine both in a conviction. And uh, this is the first case I ever heard of sexual enslavement as a crime against humanity. And uh, it's quite an interesting decision because, uh, which on that count, uh, an interesting decision, even more important than rape because that was uh, more diffused. But, uh, the, the, it's interesting because it went into the details. Is the using of a person in ownership, selling it as the case may be to other soldiers for uh, an amount that at the time was not very, very important actually, a few hundred Deutsche Marks, and. Uh, um, and uh, keeping in servitude both physically and morally and psychologically. Uh, the importance of this decision is the psychological side, because uh, what happened in that occasion, these girls were uh, detained by these people in a, an apartment and had the key of the apartment. There was evidence in court that they had the key, so they could flee away. But the constraints of the situation were such that the coercion was inevitable and the coercion, even in the protocol of Palermo, is a, an essential point of, of the crime. So, uh, starting with that, uh, uh, the international law started to consider it as a crime and at the end uh, it ended in the in the Rome Statute, of course, it had just become in the Rome Statute because it was adopted in ninety eight. But the Rome Statute is a bit ambiguous on the problem because uh, does not have the crime of human trafficking. Is not specific. You have in crimes against humanity, you have at least four crimes that you can use as human trafficking. One is enslavement. One is deportation, forced deportation. One is sexual slavery, enforced prostitution. Uh, um, other form of sexual violence on comparable gravity. So there is a number of, of crimes that are spelled out in the in Article Seven on the statute of the ICC, and then you have a provision that explains what enslavement is. And he says, enslavement means the exercise of any or all of the powers attaching to the right of ownership over a person and includes the exercise of such powers in the course of trafficking in person. So, uh, trafficking in person as such is not a crime. But of course, the act of trafficking is may be taken as enslavement, deportation, prostitution, uh, sexual slavery. There are several uh, crimes under which, but it, there is no clear clarification. I think uh, Monsignor Sanchez Soron is right. There is no clear uh, definition of the human trafficking. 
And I'm quite surprised and a bit shocked also that in 20 years now of activity, the International Criminal Court has not brought a case, the prosecutor has never brought a case of human trafficking, which is one of the crimes that would need an interpretation and a clarification if there were a clear decision of the International Criminal Court, that would become the law later. Because uh, um, the, the case law in, uh, in international law is particularly important. Uh, the interpretation, the assessment of the law, especially if you combine the text and customary international law. The decision of the ICTY was made under customary international law simply. So it was a decision that at the end, as to rape, became the law. And is considered now as being the law, is applied as the law concerning rape as a crime against humanity. So uh, the ICC should do the same. And uh, if I can make a plea now, I would say the ICC should prosecute, should bring a case. It should not be so difficult because there are, one may even have the cooperation of states in a case, in a certain case, against a trafficker. It's not a personality, it's not a head of state, a trafficker, so it can be targeted. And um, that would be extremely important. And I would say, I would add, uh, just end with one point that I think is important. Uh, the definitions of slavery in the International Covenant on Civil, Civil and Political Rights, Article 8, support the same, the same position. But I go beyond that. What is um, supporting this uh, uh, approach that I gave on, uh, um, on um, customary international law it goes back to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Because the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the first line says that the first element of uh, human rights is the inherent dignity of a person and uh, the fact that the person is free. So it's the dignity and freedom. Now what trafficking denies is both dignity and freedom. And uh, um, Article 4 of the Declaration says no one should be held in slavery or servitude. Slave trade shall be prohibited in all their forms. So it's the Universal Declaration is some is not the text that is binding as a text, but is binding in the concepts in the rights it proclaims. And um, uh, one can even go beyond that, but uh, perhaps I will keep some restraint. There is one point, which is the Declaration is universal. The declaration is universal, not the rights are universal. So my reading of universal declaration, um, I dared uh, give in this uh, interpretation at the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, uh, of Social Sciences once, that I was, uh, had the honor to be invited. I gave a reading of the word universality. I know it was a bit pretentious, to pretend to interpret what universality means. And I don't discuss, of course, the universality of the Catholic Church. That's another issue. But uh, universal means to me not that it's applicable in a given time. It's also diachronic. Universal means it's applicable through the time. It's something that uh, the rights that are there go also for the futures go for future generation. That means there is an obligation of our generation or any generation to protect the rights also in view of the future generations. And as we know, most of the traffic or a great part of the traffic concerns children. Children are generations that will be uh, active, more active later on. So in uh, not uh, clarifying the crime 
on especially as children are concerned, we go also attacking, denying rights to future generations for the future. Not to say that most of the the violation against women, of course, uh, uh, concern also future generations. So uh, it's a uh, it's a crime of crimes. I mean, uh, human trafficking, and I fully share the concern that has been expressed in the by Monsignor Sanchez Serondo earlier on this point. But of course, he did it better with uh, with doctrine. Mine is just legal expressions. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you very much, Fausto, for sharing your experience and ex legal expertise. Uh, very, very happy to, to hear that uh, indeed uh, you have uh, a long cooperation with uh, also the Pontifical Academy of Social Sciences and also that you influenced actually uh, uh, many, um, many decisions by a few important courts. So thank you very much, Fasto. If John is not uh, ready yet, uh, then uh, <clears throat> we have another Australian speaker. Uh, it's uh, uh, Brian, Brian Islin, uh, and uh, here you are. Brian, thank you also for being with us from uh, uh, Sweden, and uh, you are the founder of Slave Free Trade. Uh, you have the floor. Brian? I'm muted, hang on. I was yeah. muted, hang on. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Yep. Thanks, Michelle and, uh, and Eve, and to the incredibly distinguished colleagues on the panel. Uh, for anyone who's tuned in the last few weeks, you'll have noted one or two things about my approach. Uh, and I think Michelle likes this. I'm actually usually pretty clear about what I mean. And that I also come to this subject through a strongly mission-oriented career of more than 30 years. Over, over those years, one thing I've learned is to quickly work out what is and stay focused on the actual problem, not perceived problems. So if I can paint a very simple picture for you, when you're confronted by a man with a knife and a bad attitude, the problem is less the knife in the hand and more the guy behind it. The knife actually becomes a distraction, not the problem. Why? Because I can neutralize the knife, but the guy behind it will still be there and so will his bad attitude. Success in this case means I have to both disarm the guy and make him want to change his attitude. So given my analogy, let me make this relevant for you. Let's talk about what really is the problem confronting us, all of us here for a second. It's not poverty, it's not sexual abuse or unemployment, it's not migration, documented or otherwise, it's not being in prostitution, and it's not inadequate laws. The problem confronting us is someone who makes the moral and economic choice to exploit someone else. It's all important for us to, to understand the why behind this attitude, if for no other reason than if we're not addressing the why, we've just taken the knife away from someone who still means to kill us. For exploiting others in the workplaces, business owners' why is that every single day they calculate it doesn't hurt their business to do so and might even be some profit-making advantage in doing so. They reason, although not always in elaborate terms, that there's no business advantage for them to treat people better. And just remember for a huge percentage of the world's population that that dreadful Nobel Prize winner, Milton Friedman, convinced them that intrinsic good has nothing at all to do with business. He told them, and university MBA programs and plutocrats around the world also, tell them to make money at any cost. And so millions of business people do that every single day. There is our problem. There is the guy behind the knife. So the problem for anyone addressing exploitation, whether you define it as human trafficking, forced labor, child labor, slavery and servitude, is business people who don't find a place for intrinsic good in their business. And they abuse human rights because it doesn't hurt their business to do so. They allow a culture of exploitation to enter the workplace and set up camp. Investigating the killing of some children in prawn supply chains, I found the prawns made their way to supermarket freezers in Europe. Everyone in the entire chain was blind, 
from first port of sale to the consumer to the conditions under which they were caught. The consumer, the retailer, the suppliers all along the way were oblivious to the facts behind the product. And that is a fact of modern supply chains. So this is how I came to create Slave Free Trade, for which Michelle has invited me kindly to talk about today. After years of figuratively disarming guys, only to find them coming at us again and again, I thought this has got to end now. Let's address the actual problem, the guy behind the knife. Let's see if we can find a way to give that guy reasons not to come at us anymore. And, thinking rather hopefully utopian, see if we can give them, give that guy reasons to maybe say, I'm with you, that there is a better way, this is a better way to do business. So the slavers and exploiters over the years that I've met are not all, and excuse my French, complete bastards. Many are just opportunistic users of people, like so many of the world's population. They're not very hardcore, actually. We can take a lot of them out of the business of slaving and exploiting by giving them something more positive to strive for. And that's how we can actually systemically reduce the prevalence of modern slavery. It can't all be about intrinsic good. It still needs to boil down to money. We can give them a better place to be, but in fact it needs to be a better market to be for them to be interested. And that arrives, that means arriving at a completely new way of thinking about modern slavery, reconceptualizing human rights and work. It means building a new economic model that advantages your business if you respect human rights. An economic model that makes your human rights performance part and parcel of your bottom line, not the opposite of your bottom line. And effectively that takes turning market forces back on themselves to incentivize and reinforce good behavior. This is not going to be any small feat. Thanks to COVID, we've all come to realize that we touch our face every day and we touch slavery every day more often than we touch our faces. Your morning cup of tea or coffee, that chocolate cookie that you know just doesn't equal love, the canned tomatoes in your insanely good pasta sauce, the laptop you're watching this webinar on, the rubber in your phone case, the gold in your watch, those to die for, diamond earrings, and the shampoo you used this morning. It's not a small problem. And you've heard over the past few webinars all the numbers from which you can draw only one inescapable conclusion, that hundreds of millions of women, men, and children are being exploited and abused every single day in workplaces around the world. So against this backdrop, I very quickly have come to realize after 20 years working on slavery, that to come up with a solution, we have to be able to scale massively, which means we need to be able to automate also massively. Every law enforcement response has hit the wall at this very point. Every audit regime has hit the wall at this exact point. Scale, if you can't scale, you can never come even within radar distance of solving a problem like modern slavery. So what I suggest is we stop focusing on the negative. We stop relying on meddling at the murky end of the human rights spectrum, because the only way to detect what is happening at that end of the pool is with people like me going out and investigating. And that can't be automated. We can't be scaled. Human rights in workplaces globally exist on a spectrum. So I started to wonder what would happen if we lifted our gaze to the other end of the spectrum because we've been so myopically focused on modern slavery. What if we looked at prevention instead of treatment? What might a global vaccination program look like instead of just treating every casualty as they come in? Human rights in workplaces do exist on a spectrum. At one end is that murky pool called modern slavery and in this conceptualization you can forget for now, all the legal definitions behind it, because that murky, fetid pool at the bottom end is just characterized by low respect for human rights. Either one or two rights extremely eroded, or lots could be. In any case, we just know that life is pretty shitty down there. At the far end of the spectrum is a far better place, with fountains of warm, flowing, slave-free chocolate. Let's call that place decent work. If we can tell that someone is at the decent work end, not the modern slavery end, you know what we've just done? We've proved that there is a culture of respect for human rights in that workplace. In so doing, we have also disproved that modern slavery exists because decent work and modern slavery, let me tell you from two decades of experience, they can't coexist. They are like kryptonite to each other. 
But more than that, it's crucial to remember that all human rights issues, gender pay gap, forced labor, racial discrimination, these rise out of culture. Human rights abuses at work are never isolated incidents. If you identify the culture, you identify the issue. If you map the culture, then you know the path. The further towards decent work a workplace culture is mapped, the less likely human rights issues are present. And the higher you are on the scale, the more intolerant of and resistant to human rights abuses your workplace is. And why is this important? Because that tells us that a culture of human rights can actually inoculate a workplace from human rights abuses. So to make this examination of workplaces possible in creating slave free trade, we first needed a standard to define the decent work modern slavery spectrum. It might not surprise you to learn that when I started slave free trade four, just over four years ago, a definition or framework that could be operationalized that I could take to the field did not exist. We had to make it. And we decided it also needed to be universal. So we come back to the professor's comments on universality. I hope you'll agree with me when I say that it is completely unsatisfactory for any model that says a plantation worker in one country should work in a workplace with a lower human rights standard than a high street retail worker in England. And just because a country says a child age 12 can labor in a plantation doesn't make it right. We have this huge body of international human rights law, some of which has been mentioned here. Our rights are universally agreed. You heard it a few times last week and the week before also. We don't need any new law. But despite the presence of agreed international law on the matter, it's a sad feature of the global business world that international human rights law is an irrelevance. One of the reasons for that irrelevance is that it is so esoteric, it is not operational. If you think that most organizations, most companies, understand the international human rights obligations that apply to their workplaces, you are seriously deluded. If you think they have the will or the means to operationalize human rights treaties, you are again completely mistaken. So we decided that only a universal and very operational definition and framework was defensible. It had to be easy. It had to be easy because people are lazy. Business people are lazy. Humans have evolved to be lazy for our own good. So we started by picking all the points of existing universally agreed international human rights law that relates to the workplace, rights and conditions, and we grouped them into a set of 10 principles for decent, decent work. No forced labor, no child labor, equal pay, fair hours, no discrimination. You all know the principles, and they work for us in a cascading fashion. That is, underneath each is a handful of human rights conditions, and if you comply well with all of these principles, you have an objectively really good place to work. So operationalizing that, 10 principles, 25 human rights issues are canvassed under that. But we need to get it out to those who can tell us what's really going on. That means our model needed not just to be operationalized, but democratized. So under each condition is a handful of indicators, the sorts of things I would look for going out on an investigation. Compiling these indicators, we arrived at a global set of 100 indicators for a human rights, slave-free workplace. You'll ask me why 100, and all I can say is that because one is too few to get an understanding, and 1,000 is too many to operationalize. So we arrived at 100. And we needed to go well beyond existing standards. Every existing standard for social sustainability, and let me be very blunt about this, the so-called S in the ESG, is based on the corporate view. If you want to look at almost any existing model of certification, B Corp, Global Reporting Initiative, the Dow Jones Sustainability Index, all the sustainability ratings agencies, their evidence is pretty much entirely the corporate view. Unfortunately, if you dig down on any listing rating assessment, what a company says about itself becomes the foundation for every social sustainability report on that company. It's unsatisfactorily circular. In the same way that supplier codes of conduct are not worth the paper they are written on, a company's own assessment or an assessment by another company that they just paid for is worth very, very, very little. You can call me untrusting, but I don't want to be living in that house of cards. So we have to go well beyond the corporate view. So enter slave free trade. What we're building, what we've got is a membership system. You join us. We are a non-profit organization, an NGO that puts members, which is any type of organization, 
through continuous, all the time, real time assessment and monitoring against the framework of international human rights law. If you have workplaces and people, you should be human rights compliant. You shouldn't be in business if you're not. And if you demand it of others, then let's start by looking in the mirror. So the four core processes in our model are values alignment, workforce assessment, network mapping, and impact communications. Now, how am I going for time, Michelle? Please just send me a message if I'm... Okay, I'll keep going. Uh, values alignment is attaining the corporate view. It's a kind of desk audit, let's say, gauging the policy and legal compliance to make sure the organization at least talks the talk. The importance with this one is that we know that if the organization has what is needed in their policy toolkit, then they're at least ready to address the issues that we will later find. Workforce assessment. This is obtaining the individual view in workplaces. This process involves systematically asking, every, this is going to sound fairly big because it is, asking every single person in a workplace about their conditions in real time. All the time. We feed cross-cutting, we feed cross-cutting experiential and observational questions. So that's not just what happened to me, but what's happening around me to everybody in real time. We get a 360 degree view of the workplace. The answers are mapped back to our human rights framework so that nobody we are asking needs to know anything technical. They don't need to know what the law is because our framework translates it back up. Network mapping is the third process. This is how we understand who does business with whom. Because no organization is an island. Investors have investees, retailers have suppliers, chambers of commerce have members, churches have suppliers. And through this, we promote human rights performance within networks, taking advantage of, uh, let's say, network effects. We link their performance. So this is a behavioral process like the entire system of slave free trade. We are changing businesses who previously just bought and sold from each other into collaborators whose network's business performance becomes reliant on their respective human rights performance. The fourth process is impact communications, which is to understand and capture and eventually help communicate the members why. This is finding out why this member joined and over time mapping the impact of their process on their workforce, on their business network and eventually on their customers. Importantly, it also captures finding out how the human rights performance has impacted their bottom line and the extent to which those two things have become interdependent because that's what we want. We want a bottom line that is not separate from human rights. Human rights is embedded. So bringing these four processes together, along with measures to fix and eliminate bad practices, we're building a system that we can automate and scale. So if you think back to that human rights spectrum, what we now have is a three-dimensional human rights spectrum. We combine the framework with the four processes and breathe life into international human rights law. Instead of just the two ends of that spectrum, we have a rather more 3D scene. So Think of it as uh, um, uh, uh, two floors joined by escalators. On the ground floor is modern slavery. On the next floor is uh, on the first floor is the, uh, the, the 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 flowing fountains of warm chocolate. And there's an escalator for all of the ten principles. In fact, there's an escalator for all 100 escalators. But I, all 100 principles. But uh, questions, sorry. But I couldn't draw 100 escalators. Um, so. We can actually tell you which step you are on for every single principle. In fact, every single question that we ask in the framework. And we can tell you over time whether you're moving up or down. And if you're moving down, we can help you turn yourself around and start moving back up again. So in this model, the peculiarities and particularities of the legal definition of human trafficking, it doesn't bother us anymore. It's overall about how you are performing on each human right based on the experience of the people in your workplaces. Importantly, it doesn't just stop with the assessment. We understand what the workplace looks like. That's fine. But remember, we need to address the cause of the problem. Knowing the conditions on the workplace doesn't address the problem. The drivers of the exploiter, if you remember Milton Friedman, is the business person who's made those decisions. So we must distribute our knowledge in a way that benefits them. We've cultivated the best evidence from workplaces. And then we have to deliver that as decision intelligence to people who's consuming decisions can be influenced because there has to be a return on investment from human rights. And the idea is super simple. We provoke micro behaviors at the demand end that multiplied millions of times give us social change. Uh, Michelle, would you like me to finish there? I could keep going on, of course, but.
I've got the detail of the processes if you want to get through that. But no. you're muted, Michelle. There you go. Okay. No, uh, Brian, excellent, excellent, uh, and definitely uh, you could also answer questions. But uh, no, no, I, I like your straightforward uh, approach. Yeah. Your uh, uh, your approach uh, to the root causes. And uh, also with your field experience, I must say it's very much appreciated and uh, uh, definitely uh, thank you also for the support you did bring uh, to organize uh, uh, those webinars. Thank you. Uh, but uh, for the time being, uh, I would like, uh, uh, we, are, we are still waiting to, for the connection with uh, John uh, McCarthy, but uh, in, in the meantime, I must say, I would be happy to uh, uh, to give the floor to Don Fortunato. And Don Fortunato, I, I think that uh, uh, you gave us a video uh, uh, spoken in Italian. And uh, uh, we uh, have now uh, English undertitles. Uh, and those uh, subtitles, uh, of course, are very interesting. And, and thank you for this. Uh, this is really a very powerful uh, uh, statement, uh, uh, very powerful. Please, now uh, let's have a look at this. Cari amiche e amici, grazie per l'invito che avete rivolto a me eh, e anche all'associazione Metere che rappresento. Mi trovo qui in Sicilia quindi Italia, e sto parlando dalla sede nazionale. L'argomento che mi avete proposto di poter condividere con voi è certamente uno degli argomenti più delicati e sicuramente una delle situazioni globali ormai drammatiche già da tempo spesso denunciate, perché noi sappiamo che la tratta delle persone è veramente un'attività ignobile eh, nella società in cui viviamo o quelle società che si dicono civilizzate. Sono sfruttatori e clienti a tutti i livelli dovrebbero fare un seriesame di coscienza davanti a se stessi e davanti a Dio. Queste non sono mie parole, sono le parole di Papa Francesco che rivolse già fin dal 24 maggio del 2013. Parole forti, parole vibranti, parole che hanno scosso le coscienze di chi già si occupa da tempo di tutela dei bambini, dei minori, delle persone vulnerabili, delle persone schiave o schiavizzate per vari scopi, sia per scopi lavorativi come per scopi prettamente di sfruttamento sessuale attraverso quelle forme di prostituzione che vediamo ancora oggi, ahimè, eh, lungo le nostre strade e in tutte le situazioni di periferia del mondo. E aggiungerei anche delle periferie digitali, quelle periferie digitali che proprio attraverso, particolarmente in questo tempo di lockdown, e in questo tempo di restrizioni sono molto più esplose, si vedono maggiormente, a tal punto che non solo in questo caso la polizia italiana, nello Stato italiano, ma anche in tanti altri paesi nel mondo che hanno attenzionato questo problema, comprendiamo che c'è stato attraverso la, il web una esponenziale crescita a tal punto che gruppi eh, dove si poteva benissimo adescare i minori eh, sono aumentati di gran lunga in maniera esponenziale a tal punto che hanno portato anche delle operazioni internazionali di eh, repressione di questi fenomeni abietti ma anche pieni di orrore dove eh, non hanno risparmiato nessuno sia dai neonati fino all'età eh, all giovane dei minori. Pertanto voi comprendete che eh, questo fenomeno eh, soprattutto legato al mondo del web è un fenomeno eh, particolarmente attenzionato perché dobbiamo anche studiare, ma questi sono i documenti che spesso sono stati prodotti nel Consiglio d'Europa, 
sono stati prodotti in tante organizzazioni mondiali che si occupano di questo fenomeno, magari probabilmente eh, si occupano nel senso di studio, di analisi, di orientamento, probabilmente ehm, senza avere eh, il dato concreto di ciò che sta accadendo veramente. Però comunque, al di là di ogni cosa, noi sappiamo che eh, bisogna studiare ormai in maniera approfondita le minacce derivanti da Internet, e che internet è ormai una delle strade principali dove oggi si adescono i bambini sia per la prostituzione che per il traffico di organi o per il lavoro forzato questo ormai è un dato scontato del resto anche il Santo Padre più volte, ancora una volta mi permetto di mettere nella mia povera bocca, nelle mie povere parole le parole autorevoli del Santo Padre lui stesso ha detto che per quanto riguarda il traffico di esseri umani, anche legato al mondo di internet, faccio riferimento all'interessante dichiarazione di Roma avvenuta dopo il convegno mondiale eh, presieduto dal Santo Padre, eh, dove in questa dichiarazione ci si appellava ai grandi colossi del web affinché potessero iniziare a collaborare nel contrasto al fenomeno dello sfruttamento sessuale dei minori e soprattutto per quanto riguarda la pedofilia, la pedopornografia e considerando che lo sfruttamento sessuale dei minori poteva benissimo rientrare nelle logiche ecco, della tratta di esseri umani, ma questo lo dirò in seguito con pochissime battute per capire esattamente di cosa stiamo parlando, perché molte volte ci si può porre la domanda, ma può essere legato il, la, la categoria, la riflessione, anche il contrasto del traffico di esseri umani con il mondo del web? In effetti il Santo Padre diceva che su questo tema, la tratta di esseri umani, ma non soltanto, io aggiungo, mi permetto di aggiungere, sulla questione del fenomeno del web, che dove viene trafficato l'umano e quindi l'essere umano, soprattutto i bambini, attraverso la logica del reclutamento e soprattutto dell'adescamento, dell'induzione alla esposizione digitalizzata del corpo nudo dei bambini e quindi di conseguenza alla commercializzazione del prodotto, perché non dobbiamo mai dimenticare che le foto e i video che noi vediamo o che magari qualcuno non vuole assolutamente vedere per prendere sul serio il problema, sono già abusi avvenuti. Se sono già situazioni in cui la domanda principale che ci poniamo è ma questi bambini chi sono, a chi appartengono, di quale nazione, che cosa è accaduto o accadrà ad un neonato violato, che è un neonato, voi sapete meglio di me, l'esperienza dell'associazione Meter da 30 anni a questa parte lo dimostra, non telefonerà mai a nessuno, non chiederà mai aiuto, non prenderà mai un smartphone per mandare un help, né tantomeno un telefono per dire eh, aiutatemi, immaginate il farfugliamento, la parola ecco, di un neonato è sul problema del traffico di esseri umani riguardo alla eh, reclutamento di neonati e quindi di conseguenza tutto ciò che accade per reclutare neonati partendo dalle famiglie, dai tutori, partendo dagli ospedali, dal, da, dai reparti dove i neonati vengono accuditi o dovrebbero essere accuditi. Ecco, capite che il problema del traffico di esseri umani, il Papa stesso ripeteva e diceva in risposta ad un gruppo di bambini immigrati che sicuramente sul tema della tratta c'è molta ignoranza, ma a volte pare che ci sia anche poca volontà di comprendere la portata del problema. Perché? Lui si domandava. Credo che ce lo domandi ancora oggi. Perché? Perché in fondo questo problema della tratta di esseri umani, anche legato al web, eh, ci tocca da vicino. Tocca molto le nostre coscienze, perché è un argomento scabroso. Avete capito? Io sono convinto che chi ha ascoltato e chi ha un po' di coscienza, quando ho detto che ci sono neonati coinvolti in questo traffico abominioso ecco, della carne umana innocente, beh, chi ha coscienza sussulta il cuore, chi ha coscienza non può fare altro che non paralizzarsi, ma reagire di fronte a queste problematiche dove avvengono non solo nelle cosiddette periferie del mondo, ma anche nelle cosiddette periferie digitali fondamentale categoria per farci comprendere che il digitale, pur essendo un aspetto estremamente positivo, ha anche dall'altra parte 
il lato oscuro, che è il lato oscuro dell'uomo. E quindi comprendete che il cybercrime è un fenomeno particolarmente complesso, in ragione alla natura anche ambigua e senza confini dello spazio cibernetico. I reati informatici traggono vantaggio nelle possibilità, ma anche dalle opportunità offerte da Internet, che accresce evidentemente, ormai lo sappiamo da tanto tempo, la portata, la velocità, la facilità di esecuzione delle transizioni, riducendo nel contempo i costi correlati al rischio dell'individuazione, il concetto dell'anonimato è di fondamentale importanza, però vedete già fin da ora mi permettete che io faccio un appello ai colossi del web che non possono nascondersi o far emergere la estrema tutela della privacy degli utenti quando di fatto corre nei byte della loro esperienza eh, una questione legata proprio alla, alla, alla non conservazione dei dati che possono aiutare l'identificazione ecco, eh, del soggetto o dei soggetti che spesso si sono organizzati a livello di criminalità. Del resto lo sappiamo tutti che il cybercrime è legato soprattutto a certi fenomeni, tanto per citarne qualcuno, la droga, tanto per citarne qualcun altro, eh, la prostituzione, eh, la pornografia, ma ciò non toglie che la pedofilia e la pedopornografia, che è diventato anche uno, una, una struttura di business economico dove i bambini vengono estremamente sfruttati fin dal, dalla tenera età, non può essere non considerata come qualcosa di grave, come un fenomeno che deve imporre un impegno globale contro fenomeni globali eh, che vanno a toccare la vita intima dei nostri nostri bambini, dei nostri piccoli. Su questo io vorrei darvi una, una, una provocazione, nel senso buono del termine, noi siamo qui per costruire, non certamente per demolire, già questi fenomeni hanno demolito e demoliscono la nostra società, le nostre coscienze vengono profondamente interpellate. Però la domanda è una, è vero o non è vero che questi fenomeni possono essere considerati, quindi aggiungo anche la pedofilia, la pedopornografia online, lo sfruttamento sessuale dei bambini, e quindi anche di conseguenza la tratta di esseri umani che hanno questa finalità nel reclutamento dei bambini e soprattutto per quanto riguarda anche la commercializzazione dei corpi dei innocenti dei bambini perché sono commercializzati, non possono essere definiti in maniera chiara, eh, limpida, senza interpretazioni di sorta crimini contro l'umanità? Non possiamo pensare che questo fenomeno deve essere in un certo qual senso condiviso da tutti? Non pensate che il problema della tratta degli esseri umani che è inserita in questo contesto non può essere inserito anche l'interpretazione, spesso non condivisa da tutti, che le nuove frontiere di internet del crimine, bene, eh, amplificano questo fenomeno perché la tratta degli esseri umani costituisce un problema primario oggi in Europa e non solo, soprattutto a livello globale, lo sappiamo tutti, io sono forse il minore esperto per quanto riguarda l'analisi o l'analista del fenomeno, ma certamente posso dire una cosa in più attraverso l'associazione METER e vi consiglio in maniera molto serena, abbiate la possibilità, ci sono anche le traduzioni in inglese, dei nostri report che annualmente noi produciamo, che non sono dati statistici consegnati ad una società di statistica, ma il lavoro quotidiano dell'associazione METER che compie da 30 anni inoltrando una serie di migliaia di denunce a tutte le polizie del mondo affinché si possano sviluppare delle indagini. Ovviamente non si può pensare soltanto ad un fatto di indagine per contrastare, cosa importante. Qui si richiedono dei progetti globali, cosa che nella carta, nelle dichiarazioni, nelle intenti di, del Consiglio d'Europa, eh, dell'ONU, esistono, ci sono, però di fatto poi la traduzione concreta in fatti concreti, continuati e a tempo lungo, ecco, devono essere certamente attuati. Si fa, ma si deve fare molto di più. Certamente non basta questo fenomeno. Pertanto voi comprendete che anche gli analisti hanno ritenuto opportuno e, e pensano 
che eh, questo fenomeno evidentemente eh, trova una, uno sbocco necessario e fondamentale per quanto riguarda la questione dell'uso, lo ripeto ancora, delle nuove tecnologie, perché ehm, in materia di tratta di esseri umani, essi hanno ritenuto, gli analisti a livello mondiale, che la definizione, questo è interessante, forse ci fa andare a un passo in più, la definizione di esseri umani, di tratta di esseri umani contenuta nella Convenzione, si applica anche quando, si, quando la tratta viene praticata con l'uso delle nuove tecnologie e delle informazioni. Così, ad esempio, quando la definizione, che voi conoscete benissimo, si riferisce al reclutamento di una persona, va bene, questo reclutamento è considerato tale con qualsiasi mezzo sia stato effettuato, orale, a mezzo stampa, via internet. Evidentemente dicono che questa discussione a includere una nuova disposizione sulla questione eh, della Convenzione ecco, che rendesse la disposizione di cooperare a livello internazionale, però sicuramente queste nuove interpretazioni, ormai credo anche pacificamente accolte, possono essere applicate alla tratta di esseri umani. Ecco che le moderne tecnologie va bene, che hanno creato nuovi problemi e sfide Ecco, con una sconcertante dimensione mondiale hanno portato vantaggi all'umanità ma anche estremamente svantaggi il crimine si è organizzato e eh, dove si è organizzato? Beh, immaginate la diffusione universale e incontrollata dell'accesso noi lo sappiamo che il mondo del web è incontrollabile come si fa a controllare? ci vorrebbero gli stati dittatoriali che neanche lì riuscirebbero a controllare la il vantaggio di internet è non controllare i flussi delle informazioni, però è anche vero che bisogna regolamentare. Gli stati dovrebbero darsi una, come dire, una, una legislazione globale. Certo, è impensabile, ma io lo penso e lo dico, pensare ad una carta globale che tutti gli stati del mondo dovrebbero adeguarsi per regolamentare questi flussi criminali che riguardano soprattutto i siti di pedofilia, la pedopornografia, si è diffuso in modo globale veramente attraverso i personal computer o gli smartphone, lo sfruttamento dei bambini ha così assunto un carattere estremamente transazionale, il bambino sfruttato fotografato, videato in Brasile, me lo ritrovo ecco, nelle case dei pedopornografi eh, italiani, eh, me lo ritrovo nei, nelle case e nelle tasche attraverso lo smartphone in una pennetta, in una pendrive ecco, eh, di tutti gli uomini eh, prettamente o estremamente criminali, perché chi fa questo tipo di traffico non può essere considerato una persona per bene, ma una persona criminale che sicuramente deve essere aiutata e redenta, ma Sicuramente dobbiamo dire che il male che porta dentro la tasca è il male fatto uh, sui bambini. Allora voi comprendete che questa situazione ehm, eh, è così complessa e così delicata che eh, tutti i protocolli devono oh, non solo essere eh, accolti e considerati nella propria intenzione di mh, eh, azione necessaria per contrastare, ma dare necessariamente all'urgente questione legata alla tratta di esseri umani, nell'interpretazione che vi ho dato per quanto riguarda l'aspetto legato a internet, contrastata nel migliore dei modi. Meter cosa fa? Vedete il logo dietro di me, eh, quella è una M che fa riferimento alla Vergine Maria eh, e quindi mettere la parola greca che significa madre, accoglienza, protezione, l'associazione ha 30 anni di esperienza, è stata pionieristica nel mondo per quanto riguarda la lotta alla pedofilia e alla pedopornografia online, e nel giorno in cui io proprio a Roma ecco, mi sono imbattuto negli anni 90 nelle prime immagini pedopornografiche che venivano trasmesse online. Un mondo preistorico, ma un mondo che mi ha interpellato. Cosa fare nei confronti di un fenomeno che doveva diventare, diventò ed è presente così globale, così estremamente delicato e paradossalmente eh, sotto gli occhi di tutti o di molti e che richiede sempre e comunque un intervento incisivo, forte, intenso eh, affinché possiamo liberare questi bambini? La pedofilia e la pedopornografia 
voi eh, sapete che in vari, eh, in vari stati è definita attraverso le leggi e le norme che si sono adottate, la prima in Italia che è stata anche una pripista per quanto riguarda le nuove eh, norme che poi i paesi europei e non solo si sono adeguate o le hanno formulate, la definisce la pedofilia, la pedopornografia una nuova forma di schiavitù. Del resto la tratta non ha una forma di schiavismo? Eh, ecco, questa nuova forma di schiavitù coinvolge bambini eh, normalmente prepuberi, cioè dire da bambini da 0 massimo a 12-13 anni, cioè che ancora non hanno sviluppato ecco, i caratteri sessuali maturi. I pedofili, i pedopornografi, che da singole persone hanno strutturato una vera e propria organizzazione criminale, e vi posso testimoniare e garantire anche alla luce delle segnalazioni che Meter ha fatto in tutti questi anni, dove si sono sviluppate più di 24 operazioni nazionali e internazionali, a volte anche con addentellamenti di criminalità organizzata molto pericolosa, di cui io ho subito anche e subisco anche una questione di sicurezza da parte delle forze dell'ordine da più di vent'anni, ecco, perché mi hanno minacciato, mi hanno eh, vessato, eh, evidentemente per loro divento, assieme a tanti altri compagni di viaggio, uno dei nemici acerrimi nei confronti di questo fenomeno di sfruttamento sessuale dei bambini, allora Meter cosa fa? Cosa ha fatto? Bene, negli ultimi, tenete conto, dal 2002 a eh, 2020, abbiamo noi segnalato in tutto il mondo 61.525 segnalazioni. Per segnalazioni intendiamo che per ogni protocollo inviato, noi abbiamo anche dei rapporti ufficiali con diverse forze di polizia, in questo caso quella italiana, ma anche quella polacca, abbiamo una relazione con la Nuova Zelanda, ma anche con la Germania, con eh, la Svizzera, quindi noi cerchiamo di inviare, quando noi riteniamo opportuno, che sono i siti o i riferimenti allocati in quelle nazioni, o hanno un'estensione che riguardano eh, le nazioni, ecco, noi mandiamo la segnalazione. Quelle segnalazioni, se venissero tutte trattate, sicuramente avremmo dato un grande colpo ecco, di eh, repressione al fenomeno. Non tutte vengono spesso analizzate. La ten il tentativo eh, è quello di mandare, anche se serve provider, le nostre segnalazioni che sì, cancellano il materiale, però ahimè non hanno la responsabilità, se non solo su base volontaria, anche perché in tanti stati non c'è l'obbligatorietà da parte dei server provider di conservare i dati e di conseguenza inoltrarli alle forze di polizia e quindi questo significa che non si può fare un chiaro, forte, incisivo ecco, azione eh, contro eh, chi traffica di bambini, perché anche i video e le foto sono bambini che sembrerebbero in foto virtuali, ma sono bambini reali, già abusati. Lo voglio ribadire questo, cari amici e amiche, proprio per questa ragione, perché noi non dobbiamo pensare che la foto e il video sono virtuali, sono bambini già abusati, sono bambini che il danno alla loro esistenza è già avvenuto ed è un danno permanente, con conseguenze a lungo termine e forse per tutta la vita, ecco dei cosiddetti sopravvissuti all'abuso. E vi posso garantire, se alla luce di quello che noi segnaliamo come meter corrispondono nel rapporto 1 a 1 le foto, bene, tenete conto che noi soltanto dal 2014, eh, quindi fino al 2019, gli ultimi 5 anni, abbiamo segnalato più di 16 milioni di foto con 3 milioni 469 mila video, che corrisponderebbero di per sé, ecco, io credo che voi state entrando nel modo con cui io sto presentando la nostra attività, ecco, corrispondono veramente a decine di milioni di bambini coinvolti. E questo numero è dato dalla conferma eh, dei dati che in un certo qual senso le organizzazioni mondiali, eh, che hanno magari una visione più globale e più eh, come dire, riscontrabile, anche questo è tutto riscontrabile perché è depositate ufficialmente alle polizie di tutto il mondo, di mezzo mondo, allora voi comprendete che di fronte a questo fenomeno, se pensiamo che l'Europa ha circa 18 milioni di minori abusati sessualmente e se facciamo un rapporto 1 a 1, abbiamo 18 milioni di minori che, eh, 18 milioni di abusatori che hanno abusato di bambini. 
Allora questo è veramente drammatico di fronte ad una realtà, questo dato dei 18 milioni è stato anche ribadito da Papa Francesco nel febbraio del 2019 al congresso mondiale che è stato svolto in Vaticano per quanto riguarda gli abusi sessuali ecco, sull'infanzia nel mondo e nella Chiesa. Ecco questa è la dimostrazione che i numeri sono estremamente, eh, come dire, eh, magmatici, ma così gravi che non può permetterci di stare a guardare senza agire. Vi dico ancora di più, evidentemente eh, noi monitoriamo la rete senza mai interloquire con i soggetti pericolosi che fanno del danno ai bambini, ma ciò che noi rinveniamo, e vi invito a venire ad Abola a visitare i nostri centri nazionali, eh, che evidentemente non è soltanto una telecamera, ma è tutta una realtà molto forte, molto variegata, del resto ha 30 anni di storia, abbiamo fatto veramente eh, inciso nella, nella logica eh, del contrasto, ma soprattutto della prevenzione, dell'informazione, dell'aiuto alle vittime, volevo dirvi appositamente che eh, abbiamo noi il centro di ascolto e di prima accoglienza, abbiamo noi accolti già 1700 vittime e ahimè devo dirvi abbiamo accolto e orientato, accompagnato e sostenuto anche vittime e dei famosi sbarchi del Mediterraneo dove delle bambine e delle adolescenti erano state anche non solo trafficate ma anche ahimè violate nella loro intimità eh, e aiutate attraverso i centri di ascolto e di aiuto ehm, cercando di dare una grande speranza anche alla loro esistenza. E questa è la dimostrazione che eh, si può fare molto di più e si può fare tanto, eh, anche il nostro numero verde eh, che è nazionale evidentemente, però ciò non significa che non abbiamo dato apporti a livello anche internazionale, eh, proprio raccoglie decine di migliaia di telefonate eh, dove anche in questo caso non solo c'è un ascolto ma c'è anche un accompagnamento concreto, però voi capite che non è solo un problema legato al web, il web, pur essendo virtuale, ha un impatto nella vita reale ed è la realtà dell'uomo che ha bisogno di essere accompagnata. Mi permettete, mh, per tirare un po' le somme in questa lunga chiacchierata, quello del dirvi che in fondo in fondo eh, noi siamo coloro che passano come il buon samaritano per le strade del mondo, ma anche per le strade digitali, dove in quelle strade avviene di tutto. Avviene che ci sono anche i malcapitati, avviene anche di tutto che ci sono gli sfruttati, avviene anche di tutto dove bambini, persone vulnerabili, deboli, vengono sfruttati dalle logiche del mistero del male applicato da persone che vogliono fare del male. E allora pertanto che cosa fa il buon samaritano? A differenza di tanti altri che sono stati indifferenti e oggi c'è una grande indifferenza riguardo a queste problematiche. Noi da 25 anni Celebriamo la giornata bambini vittime, fu la prima giornata che mise in evidenza eh, proprio la sensibilizzazione ma anche e soprattutto la preghiera per quanto riguarda le vittime di abuso sessuale, di pedofilia e pedopornografia. L'abbiamo celebrata da 25 anni, quest'anno cadrà la prima domenica di maggio e che normalmente abbiamo sempre concluso eh, a San Pietro eh, con un messaggio e un saluto speciale dei Santi Padri, in questo caso del nostro ora Papa Francesco, eh, dove non solo ci incoraggia ma ci impegna, è un appello a far sì che il buon samaritano si fermi, si carichi la vittima e il malcapitato, immaginate i bambini, le persone vulnerabili, coloro che vengono trafficati anche nel web e dall'altra parte portarli in luoghi sicuri. In quei luoghi sicuri c'è ecco, il locandiere, c'è colui che cura queste persone. Ecco, noi crediamo che è possibile creare una sinergia di impegno e di lavoro, non è formalismo né tantomeno burocratizzazione, qui stiamo parlando di persone umane e ahimè, magari Dio ne potessimo salvare uno soltanto, avremmo dato senso a tutta la nostra esistenza. Vi invito veramente a visitare il nostro sito associazionemetere.org, lì troverete tutte le informazioni e speriamo che questa questo nostro incontro possa diventare un incontro fruttifero, un incontro capace di dare sempre più speranza a chi ha perso la speranza, voce a chi non ha voce e soprattutto eh, dare possibilità ai bambini di vivere la loro infanzia, perché sono i prediletti del Signore. Vi ringrazio tutti.
Thank you very much, uh, uh, Don Fortunato. Uh, actually, it's very impressive. And uh, indeed, uh, I want to uh, show this uh, slide uh, out of the website. And it's uh, also a very impressive figure. Uh, this picture would be indeed a nightmare. And uh, um, I think now uh, we, uh, I would have loved to give you uh, uh, to uh, John McCarthy, but uh, he has indeed uh, a connection problem. He will be with us in a subsequent webinar. Uh, uh, I just wanted you uh, to see that uh, uh, he is uh, uh, actually available. He is available on this website, uh, uh, on this website here, and he is also available on this uh, uh, email address, uh, John McCarthy at sydneycatholic.org, uh, because this, um, this uh, Sydney Archidiocesan Anti Slavery Task Force, I would say, is a, a model also for uh, monitoring, monitoring and checking uh, supply uh, chains. Of, uh, of the Catholic Church uh, in, uh, in Australia, and also uh, of organizing a network of, uh, um, a network of civil society and uh, public uh, authority. So I think definitely uh, I'm looking forward to listen to him. And uh, I'm looking forward also for you, if you want, have a look at this website. It's very impressive. Uh, but now I would like to uh, give uh, the floor to Sister Miriam, or uh, discussant. Miriam, you have uh, uh, 20 minutes for uh, uh, questions and answers. Uh, I'm uh, very happy to, to have you uh, now. And thank you also for your cooperation in organizing those webinars. Miriam, it's up to you. Thank you. So after the very powerful, uh, uh, video we heard from Don Fonato or, or speech. It, it is nearly impossible to say any more like seeing these incredible numbers and also knowing this is only one branch of human trafficking. And so we know the scope, we can only see. Um, it is really, it is so much, as you said, Don Fonato. It is not possible not to do anything. We have to act. We have to do something. And in this evening, I heard a lot of things that are already done uh, for uh, prosecution uh, to end this crime. And the many intelligent people are thinking about law, developing law, uh, going to courts and try to end this terrible crime of human trafficking. So that is something, um, what is a sort of consolation when we see the big scope. Um, I wanted to uh, highlight one um, point when uh, Monsignor uh, Marcelo Sanchez Sorando, he spoke about the Nordic model. And I think there's something that might, that, or I think it's very important that our listener get it clear. So the Nordic model um, has several, um, how should I say, uh, uh, um, no, has several points. So the first is that the sex buyer has to be criminalized. So the punishment goes to the person who creates the demand. And then, it's very important, and I think uh, later, uh, I think um, Morgan, you mentioned it. So the, there has to be a decriminalization of the uh, victims, of the uh, women who are forced in prostitution, because if they are not criminalized, um, they can't speak open. They don't. They are. They are fear. They are. Uh, in, 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 in problems, so this is very important. And I want to have this point very clear that the so-called Nordic model or equality model uh, is about not punishing the uh, women forced to prostitution. And there's another very important 
point uh, that they have to have help to leave prostitution. No, uh, and as I'm a, a German citizen and I was working in this field for uh, 30 years and I know that women told me we, we, you know, we are not helped. Germany doesn't follow the Nordic model, so there are no real helps to exit prostitution. Because they say, oh, it's a, it's a job, it's your job, so why to exit? And if we want to have women that are free, and I, I learned, you know, freedom is one of the main points um, of being human, then they have to have the possibility to exit, and they need help for exit. And of course, uh, they, they are the spacing. So these are points for, I think are very important to make them clear and highlight them. But maybe as I spoke about it, uh, some of you uh, want to answer or, uh, or see some points you also want to uh, be highlighted and uh, speak about to uh, our listeners. I don't know if somebody wants to take the floor about this topic. Maybe uh, uh, Professor Fausto, did you do, uh, was it a, did you want to uh, say something to the equality mo uh, model, Nordic model, or not? Okay. I don't, I'm not sure. I don't know. It's sufficient probably to comment on it, but the the, the point uh, that. Um, of the criminalization, actually, of the victims it has to be avoided clearly because the victim is a victim, and uh, um, it's uh, it's always being uh, uh, in all these crimes, in many crimes, has been uh, the the normal the normal way of getting out of situations. For instance, for the rape. The rape, uh, we had to deal in courts uh, with the consent, of course, because if there is consent, there is no rape. So, um, and uh, you can't say that you do away with the consent, because if there is consent, it's consent, I mean. But the problem is what kind of consent? Do you accept consent in a situation of violence, for instance, or you say, this situation is a situation of war, for instance, of coercion, such as consent does not count. You don't accept the proof of consent, simply. Uh, um, we had cases of uh, in which the consent was self-evident. For instance, uh, girls are detained in a place, Soldiers come in the evening, take them out to rape them, then they bring them back in this sort of prison, uh, place of detention. Well, uh, sometimes the, in these places, the girl went out uh, spontaneously, simply because it was treated better than being beaten, for instance, also, not only raped. So, to avoid uh, um, a situation that would have been even worse, said, okay, I come and did not oppose anything, but was detained, was under the control of the other, so could not really express a consent. It must be a free consent in any case. So there will be no coercion, no psychological coercion even. And uh, otherwise, it's exactly the same problem. You f finish for to to punish the victim uh, and, uh, and to, uh, and to uh, uh, acquit the, the, the persecutor, the perpetrator of the crime. So, and, and of course you have the same thing in other, in other, the prostitution, the same things. I mean, you have the same problem, I mean, uh, all the times. So the problem is to resolve it in, with, with a method we put in our rules of procedure, for instance, they were adopted by the court in the ICTY, that in cases of coercion, the consent is not admitted as evidence, simply. So there is no, no question to say consented. It's impossible. So we don't admit the evidence, simply, to, to prove it, because uh, otherwise you shift the... Um, 
responsibility on the victim. Thank you very much. That's, uh, I think that was very important to highlight. Yes, Brian. Very much for you. Is, is it possible for me to just uh, spend a minute or two on the Nordic model? Is that all right? Uh, Mary? Question completely. Is ah, okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, one of the, there's a lot to be said about the Nordic model. It's a yeah, huge issue. Yeah, but, yeah. yes. Uh, what, what I just wanted to say is that. Um, one of the reasons it it's not by coincidence that the Nordic model started in Sweden, and there is a lot to be said for. My friend, the, speak slowly. Speak slowly, please. Speak okay. More slowly. Thank you. That's not so easy for me, but yes, okay, I'll give it a shot. Um, it's not by accident that the Nordic model started in Sweden, because I think there is, uh, a, 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 and let's maybe call it a, a patriarchy index. There is, there needs to be a certain ripeness or fertility in a society to be accepting of such a model because it requires a conceptualization of prostitution as being something that's created by men for men. And unless you can, unless your society is ready to say that's problematic, then your society is not ready to implement well the Nordic model. And this is why I think, for example, in the United Kingdom, there is massive opposition to it. And, and I think in Australia, there would be in some places massive opposition to it because these societies have not sufficiently moved up in, let's say, the patriarchy index. And by patriarchy index, I'm not just saying men, right? There are also many women who buy into that and will defend that vociferously. I don't know how many times I've been told at a human trafficking conference that, uh, you know, no vagina, no say, uh, trying to kick men from the conversation, which is, I mean, it's obviously completely inappropriate, but the, the, the point is that there's this, there's a lot vested in this industry. And uh, the, the rightness in Sweden, when you say in Sweden to men, you shouldn't, you know, it's wrong to be buying sex, the majority of Swedish men are like, yeah, that's true. Okay. You know, they really do take it in. If you say that in the UK, you'll get punched in the face by so many men. So there's this, there's this point of ripeness that we need to consider in the Nordic model. I've seen the Nordic model applied in France, for example, and without any education, without any enforcement, without any policy work, besides the law on the books, nothing happens. The sides of the street are still littered with migrant women being prostituted and nothing happens to the men who buy them. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Uh, Morgan, yes. Just a very quick uh, comment on this issue of consent. Um, and what is used, coercion, etc. On the Nordic model, um, and some representing you see, I'm not going to take a position because actually we don't take an official position there. That's why I was really referring to various terminology as well because of that. Um, but when it comes to consent, and, and I do acknowledge, and I did it the first time, that the international definition of trafficking is, is complex and very hard actually to implement. Um, but I think this element of the means that are used to actually um, force the victim to do something is, is really interesting. We've, we've looked into that. We've tried to understand how states, or what they're doing with it, how they understand it. There's still so much progress to be made. We look specifically at consent and we looked, and that's also what came in that study I was mentioning, the abuse of position of vulnerability is a very, very central topic, which is extremely difficult at the moment to grasp and properly address. And, and so when the concept comes in, of course, outside of trafficking, there may be a need to look into consent. In some national um, legislation, the means that are being used uh, to, to exploit the victim are not being um, included in the national law. So the consent needs to be examined as well. But you really see that when it comes to forceful, uh, physical force, coercion, um, traditionally that's 
quite easily accepted uh, in the criminal justice system. But when it comes to more subtle means, uh, it's, it's really difficult. I think we still need to do a lot of work here. And that's why these uh, links that I've made, uh, these connections with other problems. Uh, Brian was mentioning patriarchy before. Uh, we're talking about domestic violence, gender-based violence against women, against children, etc. We need to make connections there so that we understand better the psychology there and how people can really become under the control of someone uh, for reasons uh, that for people like a lot of us, I mean, even if we, we understand and we know the problem, we we don't necessarily really understand why the victims end up in that situation, why they don't say no, why they don't escape. This is very difficult to understand for people who have not really been confronted to this issue, who have not been in this position. Still so much, so much to do for awareness and understanding to increase there. Um, and it's, all, it's true on trafficking, but it's true on many other issues where gender and, and children related issues are at stake. So I hope we'll, we'll work together in that direction. I think that's really what we heard tonight, that we're seeing it from different angles. But I think the, we have a common goal here, which is to, to stop uh, the exploitation of, of people, uh, <coughs> women, children, men as well, um, and, uh, and, and taking the responsibility for it, all of us. Thanks. Uh, I saw Monsignor Marcelo raising the hand. Yeah. It's true. Uh, I want, uh, of course, I, I want to say that I agree with the different things, but of course, when I speak about the Sweden model, I say it's a general model. Each country needs to have an adaptation at the different situations. So for this reason, I say the best thing is to put uh, the law uh, to defend and to promote the human, the dignity of the body. And we can use one or another model again. But for example, the application in France, I think is very good because uh, one of the consequences, the obligation of the state to control the situation first. Second is that the state need to organize also the solution of the people that are victims. And also, uh, they, when the people say, but the state not have the money, the state take the money of the traffickers, of the consumers. So this is fantastic. So I think this is very important to have a sort of good circulation. But the, I want to go to the question of Father Fortunato, that was fantastic. And I, I, I want to remember that the meeting was made in the academy and was organized by the academy. So <laughs> not the Vatican in general, was the academy. And I say this because when the, the person that today follow this question in the European countries, uh, that is the American, that was one of the organizers of the meeting, Ernest, Oh, I don't remember. Ask to the news because the problem today is that some country, European country, want to stop this law, European law that is the unique to permit authorize when there are a case grave to have an intervention in the private, and uh, they want to change this law. So Henry Muller, Henry Muller, one, to in this moment, this is in, in July, and the president, the, the new president of the Commission is the president, is the representative of Portugal. Portugal. So uh, they speak with the nuncio, and the nuncio say that the minister of the foreign affairs of the Vatican, Monsieur Gallagher, say. Oh, it's not the task of the nuncio to, uh, to organize the law, but as we say, but what are always the tax of the nuncio? So it's a ridiculous thing. So that is to say that we need to work together. And also, I want to say to Monsignor Fortunato that another thing. In this meeting, I want to say, to declare that this is a crime against humanity. 
for the reason that I say before. But they don't say this, don't want to say this, because the CEO of, the, of this organization don't want. So look, we need to arrive also to put a law in this in this field. And 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 look, it's not po it's, it's possible that they can the CEO of this international organization can have intervention. We see this very clear when they intervention in the question of Trump, President Trump. They just say no. Could you look and speak? You can. And what is the reason that they? For the motive of defense of the uh, of other reason can make intervention. What is the reason that they can do intervene when it's a question really of moral subsistence of the humanity? So thank you. I don't want to say more. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I, I see the time passing. I'm not sure if we can take one question from the Listeners, or stop. I give, I hand over to Michelle to answer this question. No, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much. Actually, uh, I will, I will not answer the question publicly because to say uh, whether the law is uh, uh, <laughs> evolving as fast as technology could be a conference in itself. And uh, as I know, Claude Begley who asked his very, very good question. I will, I will send him. Uh, 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 a partial answer and to say obviously not yes obviously not uh, but still there are ways and means uh, to deal uh, with uh, the bad use of technology and to use technology on the contrary to uh, uh, to prevent and to combat uh, human trafficking but uh, on that we definitely shall organize a, a, a webinar on, on this very very interesting topic and uh, 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 I invite uh, all of you to be there, and including uh, my friend uh, Claude Begley. Uh, but uh, now, really, thank you, Miriam, for being uh, the discussion. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you, Fausto. Thank you, Don Fortunato. Thank you, Brian. And uh, Monsignor, thanks also for being with us. Uh, I would like also to, to mention uh, of course, my, my assistants were first uh, Yves Reichenbach, webmaster, and uh, uh, three young ladies who helped me in organizing those webinars, Karen Lee, Clara Izepi, and Anne Astrid de Kiriswet. Uh, as you, you know, all the past webinars are available on our website, uh, uh, org with English and French subtitles. And obviously, criminal prosecution is only one part of the combat against human trafficking. Prosecution is not enough. We must care for victims and address root causes if we want to effectively combat human trafficking, as uh, uh, Brian uh, uh, said so powerfully, and as uh, I'm sure John McCarthy would say in a, in a subsequent webinar. And uh, actually, the, the aim is indeed a global mobilization uh, uh, to uh, do, as uh, Pope uh, Francis is asking it, uh, eradicate uh, uh, modern slavery. And in April, we shall start a series on the roots causes of human trafficking. And uh, in the meantime, I do encourage you to visit the uh, www.christusliberat.org website where you will find a treasure chest of best practices and access to a free online course on human trafficking for helpers and opportunity to register to all future webinars. So thank you, everyone, and goodbye now. See you soon. Bye-bye.